Okay, so next is from Hugo. The breakthrough meditations in the end of MM did wonders for me. And I go as deep into union as I've ever been with. I contemplate some of the realizations that took root in me there. I'm absolutely loving the Hamsa meditation, but thus far it has not taken me as deep into union as contemplation does. Because of this, at some point in my meditations, I feel pulled to switch to contemplation of I am. God is calling me and I cannot resist. It feels as though I have to choose between focusing on the breath or fully expressing the self, but maybe this I false. I think that might have been a typo. Um, and I should practice feeling I am while still holding on to the breath. I crave uniting in every meditation, but maybe it's better to be patient and practice hamsa until it yields the same result. Any thoughts on this? Love this question, Hugo. This is really great. I've been wanting to touch on this actually. So Hugo is describing when you start to feel that pull in meditation to give all your attention to the I am feeling and that can feel like, well, I have to leave the breath to go to the I am because I can only really give my attention to one thing at a time. And so here's the important point. The most important practice, and you might even say the only true spiritual practice there is, is awareness of self or awareness of God. And so every other practice we do is like a preliminary practice to hone the mind, quiet the mind, heal the mind, cleanse the energy, right? To get us into a place where we can actually be aware of I am and hold and sustain that awareness for long periods of time. You might also say that the, the distance to abiding in I am as a permanent state, which we would call enlightenment, is measured in how much time you spend kind of soaking or melting into that feeling during your daily life. So like, I'll just make up an arbitrary example. It's probably, it's different for everybody. There's no set amount of time we could possibly say, but let's just suppose that you had to accumulate a full year worth of meditation on I. If you knew that, the only thing standing between me and absolute liberation is spending one year of accumulated time meditating on I am. I bet you you'd get to work pretty quick doing that as often as possible, right? <clears throat> so it's like, that's, that is kind of the case. And it's, it's not linear, but we have to gradually deconstruct the false I, our false identities, the wrong ideas, the wrong beliefs we have. And in a sense, although spiritual practices are very good, this is something Ramana Maharshi was famous for teaching, right? is that whether you do mantra meditation, whether you do um, good deeds, acts of service, whether you do breath work and, and meditating on the breath to quiet the breath, none of those practices themselves can take you beyond the I who does the practices, the, the doer, the actor, the meditator. Uh, to go beyond the meditator, the finite, limited sense of self, you have to melt into the feeling I am as often as possible. This was also Nisargadatta's chief practice, right? Hold on to the feeling of I am, I exist, I am the subject of my experience. Hold on to that knowing in the same way that a suffocating man holds on to oxygen. <clears throat> so we've all had the experience of, especially being a little kid, right? And you learn how to swim and you're wanting to dive into the deep end and I used to like take big rocks to the bottom of my pool so I could like walk on the floor of the pool and fun stuff like that. And you get to a point where you're like, oh, I got to get some breath and you drop the rock or you kick off the bottom and you're swimming to the top and you feel that carbon build up and you're like, oh man, I'm, I'm going to have to let my breath go any second now. And you just break through the water surface and <gasps> breathe in. It's whew, so satisfying and so relieving. Can you capture that? tension you feel inside 
right before you break the water and get to breathe, and that, that desperate yearning for oxygen, try and cultivate the same desperation to know who I am, to remain aware of who I am. Because if you can, your attention would never leave it. And in a very short period of time, if you could sustain that unbroken, it definitely wouldn't take you a year. It may be a matter of days or weeks before you'd be immersed in that state permanently. So the I am is incredibly powerful, but we have this mind, this monkey mind, that constantly yanks us out of it and back into separation and the, the material realm. And so to accumulate lots of time in I am starts in meditation, right? If you can't sit down and be quiet and connect with it, good luck connecting with it, driving down the highway and talking to someone at work and doing dishes. There's no, you have no chance, right? So you need to first get some stability, right? Learn to crawl before you walk. And that's what meditation is. But even Rana Maharshi said, meditation eventually must be abandoned because it's a kind of uh, kindergarten spiritual practice. Isn't that interesting? It's like very useful as a preliminary stage, but eventually you have to go beyond the need to go sit down and actually be quiet because you should be able to be quiet and present as I am every day, all throughout your day, right? That's eventually where you will naturally be residing all the time effortlessly. So if you can't effortlessly be in the I am and how I would describe that state again is that detached alertness, meaning being aware of I am doesn't mean you're like delusional about life and you're not even noticing what's happening in the world because you're so in this bliss state. There may not even necessarily be like a lot of tangible bliss being felt, but there is a relaxed, effortless sense of presence where you're not, there's nothing you want from the material world. You're truly not, there's no desire for it or fear of it. You're like, it's all just God, dancing God, expressing God, being God. So there's nothing to fear and nothing to chase after. It's all just me. So I just witness life. I just, he I'm here to watch the unfolding of life because if life is the sacredness of God expressing, I wanna be clear and awake and present for that expression. I wanna see every second of it. I don't wanna miss a thing. And that desire to meet with God through form, through the world, through expression, is what keeps you grounded in the I am. So you see how that's that collapsing of inner and outer worlds or duality. You gotta, you gotta bridge that gap of duality between my inner world and my outer world. And how else could you do that but by seeing that God is everything, right? That's the practice of kingdom consciousness. We could say we bring the inner world towards the outer by meditating on I am and being immersed in that I am. And we bring the outer world towards the inner world by seeing that it's God, by seeing the perfection, the divinity of everything. And then we realize, oh yeah, inner and outer are one single reality expressing. So to come back to your question, Hugo, if you're craving connecting with I am, you better follow that feeling for sure. That is the self pulling you inwards, meaning you're actually starting to catch the whiff, the fragrance of the true self, and your nose is like following the scent and the fragrance. Oh, what is that most wonderful smell? I want to find out what that is. That's the craving to meditate on I am. So any one of us who feels that, anyone listening right now, when you feel that, act on it. And especially guys, start to notice it during your day, right? Not, don't just do it when you're sitting in a, on a meditation cushion, but when you're sitting at your desk, Notice the part of you that wants to think about God and act on that part of you, right? Say yes to that part of you by actually thinking about God. Once your God idea becomes big enough, expansive enough, that you can just think the word God in your mind and immediately reality just starts dawning in your awareness and, oh wow, this, the bliss of who God is immediately starts to overwhelm your senses. That's what, that's what we should practice cultivating, right? That's your God idea. And if anybody were to ask me, Aaron, what's the fundamental difference between you and I? Why are you so happy all the time? Why don't you suffer anymore? Why are you so at peace inside and I'm not? Why do I suffer so much and you don't? I would probably say the simplest answer would be 
because my God idea is bigger than yours. You know, your God idea is too small. So how could you have joy if God's the source of all joy and you can't even see God in the person in front of you? You can't even see God in the sunlight, in the sky, in the clouds, in the wind. If you can't experience God easily and effortlessly as all creation, how would you have that joy that is God? So you got to expand your God idea. That's kingdom consciousness. So that's why when I gave that lecture months ago on kingdom consciousness, I was equating that as the way to abide in the I am state, because it's not just about who you are, but about where you are, because where you are is part of who you are. So it's like, I'm not just the Christ because then the mind could fool me to think, well, you are the Christ, but you're in a broken, separate, evil, terrible world that needs lots of correction. The ego mind could definitely fool me about that. And it does. And it has for all of us. So we outwit the devil. We outwit the ego by saying, oh, I'm already in the kingdom of heaven. I am already walking in a perfect universe. And when you hold that attention and that belief in your heart, and every time the ego implies that an imperfection is arising, you go, oh, imperfections can only arise in dreams. I must be dreaming. And then I awaken to reality. Oh yeah, everything's perfect. It's all a lesson that God would have me learn. It's all karma playing itself out. There's absolutely no imperfection here. That's kingdom consciousness, right? When you practice that, that is the equivalent of meditating on I am. Because now you're not just the Christ, but you are the Christ in the kingdom. And you need both of those in your awareness, right? To truly be established in that state and make it a permanent state that doesn't come or go. And so as, as we practice getting into this state more and more, there will absolutely be emotions and reactions that seem to take us out of it. And this is maybe the most difficult part of the practice is transcending the guilt or just not being touched by the guilt that ego tries to lump on top of those things that especially like if we're in a very peaceful state of being, we're really connected to God and we're like, wow, this is it's like a new level. This is amazing. Well, don't expect it to stay for too long before the ego tries to yank you out of it, right? It's going to do that over and over and over for years. So just gear up for that and be ready for that. Because if you know that that's what the ego is going to do, you can be ready to circumvent its attacks, right? In the sense that I'd, I no longer place my sense of security on what I'm feeling. If I'm in a blissed out state or a really contracted state, none of that changes what I am. I am the Christ always in the kingdom. And if I think I'm anywhere else, I'm just dreaming. So I just need to wake up, but none of it changes what's fundamentally true. A man asleep on the couch, dreaming that he's running away from Godzilla in Tokyo. The dream character he's projecting wants safety and security and peace so bad. And it's terrified of this predicament it finds itself in. But does the man on the couch need any of that? Nope. The man on the couch already has security and safety and peace. He's sound asleep on a Wednesday night. So all the dream character needs to do is remember its waking state again and again, over and over until it can't forget the waking state. That's all we're doing, guys. We're just remembering again and again, our waking state, the Christ, the I am consciousness individualized. That's what I am. And so if I keep forgetting that and I keep playing the ego character, I just need to keep remembering it more. So there's no use to be guilty when I, when I cuss at someone, when I make a selfish decision in some way, I don't need to guilt trip myself. I just need to realize I am dreaming. And should the dream character feel guilty that he's dreaming about running from Godzilla when it's not true? None of that even matters. Once you realize you're dreaming, the whole dream is disregarded as unimportant. What's important is the waking self, the waking state. And in the same way, we have to practice remembering the truth over and over and then not giving in to the guilt of, oh, there you go again. You just slipped back into ego again. Oh, you have no, no shot at abiding in the I am state. Look how quickly you get pulled out. Blah, 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 blah. That's the ego's game, isn't it? It wants to just waste your time 
with disempowering ideas to convince you you're not already what you're seeking. And you are. So go into it in meditation, yes, but also go into it in your daily life, in your practical life, yes. And that's what I call the practice of kingdom consciousness, always remembering where I am because I can't know I'm in a perfect universe without knowing simultaneously that I must be a perfect being. One implies the other. That's the power of implication in metaphysics. If I know I'm in a perfect universe, that implies there's no imperfections in a perfect universe. Duh. So then I must be a perfect being. And so that's one of our mantras here, right? I am a perfect being in heaven, here and now. It's this absolute denial of anything that's false. And you can repeat these truth affirmations, like the one we did in the meditation as well. I am awake and aware in reality itself. Doesn't that cause a kind of awakening? Doesn't that cause you to want to overlook the illusions your mind is entangled in in that moment? In reality, there's no tank, no entanglement. There's no illusions. There's no problems of any kind. And just to know that and remember that is showing you where you want to be, right? I want to be in reality. It's so much more lovely than the ego's thought system. As we practice it, we know it and we love it more and more. And it, the gravity of it, like a black hole starts to pull us in. One who loves the self that they are their true and perfect self begins to get swallowed by that self. And that, that sounds and feels scary to the ego, but you become the thing that swallows you. <laughs> it's not that you disappear and get swallowed. You get swallowed and become the swallower as it happens. You become the self that was pulling you inwards, right? You realize, oh, I am that self that I've always loved and wanted to experience and wanted to know. I am already that. It's actually the most childlike realization that one can have. So I guess for some practical application, Hugo, um, I'm very much the same as you. As soon as I get into meditation, I want to just blast off into I am. And sometimes on some days, I'll notice the mind is a little too noisy and I'll, I'll try to pay attention to I am. And then it's like, oh man, you have that meeting later today and you need to remember all the things you, you prepared for the team and if I notice that, then I'll say, all right, let's count 30 breaths. And I'll just count 30 inhalations and exhalations as slowly as I can. You know, the classic, when you're breathing in, be aware that you're breathing in. When you're retaining the breath, know you're retaining the breath. When you breathe out, know you're breathing out. And just be really dialed into the breath like that and see if you can count to 30 breaths without getting pulled off somewhere. And I would say you should drop into every stillness meditation, not Kriya, but when you get to your meditation portion, maybe that's one way you practice dropping in that if I can't even focus on 30 breaths in a row, then I may not have the presence of awareness to really connect to the truth of I am. So let's do that first. And then from that stillness, start to connect. That's another useful way of using a preliminary practice to, get, to lead you to the real practice. So although all spiritual practices, even meditation, are technically distractions from the truth, they are nevertheless very helpful and very useful as preliminary stepping stones, again, to quiet the mind, expand the awareness, um, clear out the blockages, and then we can connect to the reality that we are. So there's a few tips for you. <laughs> hey everyone, thank you for watching today's video. I hope that you were truly blessed by it. And I wanted to let you know that I'm really excited to now be partnering with an amazing conscious supplement company called Organifi. A lot of you know that I'm also passionate about holistic health and nutrition. And Organifi has been a staple in my daily health routine for a very long time. They make the most delicious, organic, and high quality superfood products that I've ever come across. And as you know, a healthy body is a great benefit for spiritual growth because the health of your body directly translates to the health of your mind. Everything is connected. So feeding your body with high vibrational superfoods straight from the earth 
is one of the best ways to create that environment for a healthy mind. But getting all the superfoods that your body needs in one day can admittedly be a little bit tough. And that is where Organifi can add a ton of value to your life. I personally start every day off with green, which is Organifi's really delicious blend of 11 superfoods like ashwagandha, chlorella, and moringa. And then in the middle of the day, I'll usually have a scoop of red, which is a delicious energy blend full of 13 adaptogens and antioxidants from berries to recharge your mind and body with a delicious blend of organic superfoods. Your body is an amazing organic machine, but it needs the right fuel and signals to function at its best. And red is full of adaptogens sourced from organic herbs and medicinal mushrooms. And these are compounds that balance hormones, prime your energy pathways, and alleviate stress. So instead of crushing your adrenal system with huge doses of caffeine every day, adaptogens work with your body and give you natural, sustained energy all throughout the day. What's most important to me though about Organifi is the way that they go above and beyond to ensure the cleanest and purest ingredients in all of their products. They are USDA certified organic, non-GMO, gluten-free, certified glyphosate-free, and absolutely zero fillers. So I never go anywhere without Organifi and I never miss a day without taking it. And Organifi is offering a super generous discount of 20% off of your entire order when you use the coupon code ABKEY at checkout. So if you wanna upgrade your health regimen with Organifi, you can click on the link in the description box below to learn more about all the amazing products that they offer. And I promise you that your mind and your body are gonna thank you for it.